Okay, hi, Denver Holt here. Uh, for those of you who have been watching the Snowy Owl Cam, uh, I'm back in Montana, and so in the Owl's Dude office, and we thought we would give you a little overview and then answer some of the questions you've had. It's been difficult to communicate with you up there in Alaska this year, so um, we were able to do it a little bit, but now I'll just kind of give you an overview. Uh, we found five nests. And one of the nests failed early on. We found the male dead about 40 meters from the nest. Unsure as to why. We kind of x-rayed. It didn't show any signs of trauma or being shot or anything. So the next step is to see if we can, you know, kind of look at it from, you know, a necropsy perspective than a histopathic perspective and if we can determine the cause of death. Consequently, his female failed. She sat on the nest for six days. There were two other males about 1,000 meters either side of the nest. I was hoping one of them would pick up the slack and feed her as she was screaming for food, but neither of them did. And nonetheless, I was pissed at them. So um, that nest failed. It had seven eggs, which would indicate a good male, good female, and a good area. The other four nests, um, they all uh, are producing young to fledging, and it varied from at least two to five at the cam nest. And so um, that was it. I, you know, overall, a low lemming year. But for those that nested, at least they produced some young. We did learn that to the east of us, about 200 miles, uh, many snowy owls were nesting. They were in Alaska, but they were on the oil fields. Well, we weren't able to get out on the oil fields this year, but we heard that perhaps up to 70 nests occurred to the east of us. So with that, I'll try to answer some of the questions that you've sent into Liberty, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we have a bunch of really great questions here, so we'll just get started. So the first one uh, came in from Northwest Girl, and she said, when will the owls fly free and hunt on their own? Yeah, when will they fly free? Well, they're flying now, um, so technically I guess that's free. But uh, hunting on their own, they're, still, they're probably still trying to hunt. Uh, Matt's up there right now watching them. Uh, I'm back here. But that's normally what we see is once they acquire some flying skills, but it still takes a while because they're – crash landing they really don't know how to fly that well yet but they um they start seeing stuff and diving in on it but sometimes it's just a chirp it looks like you know a lemming out there and they'll jump down and grab it and pick it up and put it in their mouths uh but they're still dependent on the male in particular uh for food but they're also acquiring those skills okay so another one from northwest girl how much longer do the owls stay in this area before they disperse and then is it known where they'll disperse to or um, how long we're going to be able to watch them here on the can? Yeah, you know, what, what we've kind of derived over the years, normally we finish up right in early September. And so the owls are still there at that time. And so what we've been able to figure, this is just kind of piecing information together, that by, you know, mid-September into October, it appears that you're on your own and you know, innately they're programmed to migrate, and so the birds do head out. And so by October, we're starting to get reports of birds boarding ships or flying down the coast or getting in trouble uh, somewhere, you know, maybe uh, getting killed or something like that. So it appears that, you know, towards the end of September, you've got to pretty much, be, you know, be able to do it on your own, and then you're starting to migrate and birds pushing through and migrating into October is what we think, just from piecing all the information together. Okay, and so where they will disperse to? Yeah, where are they going to end up? It's hard to say. You know, um, I think sometimes we forget that snowy owls are migratory, and so the birds are, you know, programmed to migrate. Where they'll end up, you know, who knows? I'm always hoping that we'll get a big eruption year here in the Pacific Northwest, but that doesn't happen very often. However, with um, the high number of nests to the east of Barrow this year, could indicate if they fledge, you know, four or five young per nest, uh, I could indicate that maybe we'll get a bunch of birds in the Pacific Northwest this year, where normally, you know, uh, the birds tend to show up in the Great Lakes region in Northeast United States. So um, I would say by the time November comes, we're going to start seeing some birds somewhere. Okay. All right. So continuing with migration, this question came in from Berta, and she says, does one parent migrate before the other? Yeah, does one parent migrate before the other? It appears that the females come to a point where they, they just up and leave. 
and the males tend to stay in for a little while longer and feed the chicks. And you, you've probably seen that in the camera this year. You know, once the female gets off the nest, she's usually hanging around the chicks. She'll be there for some protection, but the male does pretty much all the feeding and all the nest protection, even though she's there. And we think she's just, you know, molting, replenishing her reserves. And she just shows less and less interest as autumn moves on. And then it appears that the females just, you know, get up and go. And the males shortly thereafter, and then the chicks are on her own. Okay. And then second part to that question, how far, how far north do they generally go? How far north? Well, I think, I'm thinking you think south, but um, how far south? They get out to, let's just say, the border of United States and Canada, you know, the northern United States and southern Canada from Seattle to Boston. However, some birds, you know, do stay in the Arctic throughout the wintertime. I'm not sure about chicks, but um, based on observations there at Barrow, over the years by my nuclear friends. Uh, there appears to be snowy owls that do spend the winter up there. And there's also some indication with some of the satellite studies, ours being one of the first, uh, more information now with some of the Canadian or Norwegian researchers, that some birds will stay up in the Arctic th throughout the winter time, but it tends not to be young birds, it tends to be adult birds. And whether it's favored by females or males, no one really knows that yet, and sample sizes are relatively small. Until we get really bigger samples, uh, right now we can just say, you know, these many show this and this many show that. And until you want to start spending winters in Barrow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so once we buy a house in Barrow, if we ever can afford it, uh, then we'll be able to spend some winters up there and do some winter research on snowy owls and lemons. Okay. So if you're out there, we can use a house. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, the next question references that video that I showed you that was posted of the owl preening mm -hmm. and wanting to know um, if it was a parent or one of the young. Yeah, we, we just looked at that video and tried to blow it up and get a better look at it, Lily and I. And uh, it looks like an adult. Um, I believe it might be the adult female. One of the things that we've learned over the years is that when they arrive in the spring, through the course of, you know, last, the previous year and the winter, the melanin in their plumage either fades or wears out, but nonetheless they get lighter and lighter as the winter progresses. And then during the breeding season when they move back to the Arctic, they're really quite light when they're on the nest. Then as they begin to molt, which starts pretty much as they incubate, as they begin to molt or replace their body feathers and their flight feathers, it's very, very rich in melanin again, and they appear as a completely different looking bird. And I believe that uh, given the proximity to the camera, this was probably the adult female and she has replaced most of her, you know, body feathers and it appears a, a lot of her flight feathers and she's very, very rich. And that's where aging comes in. It's really difficult because these females look like young, young birds again once they molt their new feathers in. I won't say they look like hatch year birds or first year birds, but they definitely look like birds that are of a younger age class. Okay. Yeah, and you and Matt continually say that it's harder to to sex them than than you think. Oh, it's it's, it's so much harder. You know, e even you know, we've been doing this a long time, and we see these birds, and we think, ah, male, female, first year bird, greater than first year bird, and it can be very, very difficult. So when people tell you they can unequivocally sex them at three hundred yards in a spotting scope, I would challenge that, unless it's a bright white adult male. Right. Okay, and yeah, that video in question came in from Bob. He's one of the cam ops and has... Thanks, Bob. Yep, yep, done a great job. Um, okay, let's see. Next question came in from Debbie. Are all of the wires the owls are sitting on safe or is electrocution possible? Yeah, you know, Debbie, with all the years I've been there, we've never, ever found a bird below a telephone pole uh, as an indication of any electrocution. So I, I don't know about the safety of the poles and the power lines there, but we just haven't seen it. Um, so that's all I can say. I don't really, I don't know if they're safe personally. Um, and we've never investigated it, but we've never found a dead bird that was, or a bird that's been electrocuted. Okay. All right, so we have a series of questions from Meadow. And um, the first one is, I know foxes are still a risk at this stage for the owlets, but what about Jaegers, other birds, or any other animals that are... Yeah, you know, at this stage, I don't think there's much of a threat. You know, uh, foxes early on, you know, maybe they get an egg or small chick or a chick that's, you know, uh, left the nest, but before they can 
fly or are large enough to fend for themselves. But I don't think there's much of a threat. You know, it might occasionally happen, but remember, presumably the male is still there, but it's probably getting close. And so any foxes that come in the neighborhood, the male is going to whack. And if the female, if she's still around, uh, they're going to take care of the foxes. You know, when we're there, it's really interesting. It's different. You know, the male will come in and whack us, and the female will sit there most of the time. But if you throw a dog out there, you throw a fox out there, they totally change their behavior. They abandon us, and they go right after the canines. So I would think there's no threats to them by foxes right now. Uh, you know, maybe on rare occasion during a battle or something like that. Uh, as far as the Jaegers go, the Jaegers probably just keep harassing them forever because that's kind of their behavior. The gulls may harass them, but I think the chicks are big enough now that um, they don't have to fear much. Maybe maybe a golden eagle, maybe a bald eagle, some you know larger bird of prey. Um, if they were injured, it could be you know any large mammalian predator. But I think for the most part right now, it's just uh, starvation. Okay. Um. Speaking of that, how was the brown lemming count this year? Average? Yeah, lemmings, yeah, the lemming, the lemming thing is, you know, very, very interesting. I would say it was another low year for lemmings based on our trap results. We had a slight increase um, from last year, but still not enough. So last year, I think we had seven nests and four made it. This year, we had five nests and four made it. Um, so lemmings, what I would say, is low. Uh, it was a low year again this year, and I keep hoping for that next big lemming year. Now, our sampling did indicate in one of our trap sites, uh, we had a tremendous number of young lemmings being born at our Nunavak site. So we're hoping that this uh, kind of translates into an upcoming year next year. But one of the things we've learned is that what happens in our last, our autumn or fall trapping session for lemmings doesn't always indicate it's going to be a high year the following spring because we never know what goes on under the snow. But uh, the lemmings, you know, for the most part, they're, they're, the trend is still downward, but a slight tick up after last year. And we're just, uh, we're just waiting for that next big year, and who knows what it will be. Okay. And the lemming trapping is actually still active. Yes. Matt's up there right now. Matt is up there right now doing the last of our lemming trap. We try to sample three times a year. Uh, we don't always make it to three times a year uh, for various reasons. Uh, our, our spring trapping is always good, and, and our mid our midsummer trapping is always good. But just various things happen, you know. Sometimes we have to leave, or sometimes is the water's too high to get across one of our sites, or there's polar bears in the area. You know, there's various things. So it's very different from writing on paper and actually going out in the field. Okay. Um, okay. Next question from Meadow. This seems to be a very successful year here so far. Has it been like this at this nest in previous years where all the owlets have survived to fledge? Yeah, I, I won't say it's a big nesting season, but of those that did hatch, uh, yeah, everybody produced young, all four nests. So I, I'm pleased with that. And the cam nest, that area, there's just something about that area. Even though it looks terrible, it's in between the researcher boardwalk, the gas pipelines, the snow fences. I mean, it's ugly. And uh, every year, pretty much every year, there's a nest here, and usually they do well. And if that is the same male that always whacks me and laughs at me and cackles at me when I'm there, there's something about that area. So maybe the structures, I was just discussing this with another lemming researcher, maybe just the structures that are out there help protect the lemmings and are good for higher populations of lemmings, plus they're along the roadside, plus... You know, in some ways it melts off sooner, but in other ways the structures gather a lot of snow and lemmings can find relief during the spring and hide from owls and Jaegers and whatever else underneath the snow. But for some reason, that area uh, tends to be one of the better areas that's right next to the road. And interestingly, I can't remember what year it was, but it was several years ago, on just the other side where the uh, snow fence is and the pumping station, so across behind the camera, you'll see a red pumping station there, um, they had nine eggs, nine chicks, nine fledged, uh, which is just remarkable. You know, the highest we've had is 10 eggs and only four fledged of that clutch. But this site here is, it always does well, and I don't know a real good explanation other than maybe there's just something about all these buildings and structures and being close to the road, which is conducive for uh, lemmings and consequently the owls. Hmm. Yeah, and the structures that might be affecting um, how the lemmings do, it also gives the owls maybe an advantage 
they're up in the air, they can they can hunt with more success, maybe. You know, that, that, that's a good point that you make, and not just ourselves, but many of the other researchers that are there, you know, a lot of climate researchers that walk that boardwalk out of about a mile or more uh, into their studies, they often say, geez, Denver, it seems like that the owls, you know, hunt off all these poles and use us to flush lemmings, and fly down and scoop the lemons up if we kick them out from under the boardwalks and stuff. So I think I think there might be something yeah. to that. And, um, Even though at first glance it looks like an unlikely spot. Our other nests are way out in the middle of nowhere. And this one that's in the thick of all of this activity um, is it, the one that really seems yeah, to... Yeah, consistently does. Yeah, it, it, it or that fun. area at least. Yeah, and, 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 and there is something I think about the road system that we need to investigate. I Sometimes I wonder if there's not more lemons or more owls along the road. We're trying to statistically look at that right now and uh, see what we come up with. Just a hunch. Do you feel like the road is a threat to the young owls at all? Uh, no, it's a threat to the young owls, like being hit by cars. Yeah. You know, it may happen, but I don't believe, mm -hmm. you know, it's anything that would affect, you know. Because it is a ways out. Something more than an individual from time to time. Right, you know? right. I mean, the, the road is there, but it's not really close by. No, no. And, yeah, I, I, I don't think it would happen very often. Yeah. Uh, or at least not enough to affect the population in general. Okay. Okay, next question from Meadow. Uh, where do these outlets go when it starts to get dark for winter and do any snowies stay for the dark winters? You did kind of address yeah, that. Yeah, I kind but... of addressed that. Mm -hmm. the, the chicks, as far as we know, most of the chicks head south. I imagine they're all programmed to head south. And so it is starting to get dark, and I don't think, you know, I'm not so sure darkness has a lot to do with it. Maybe, you know, it's a circadian thing. It gets dark, days are getting shorter, you're programmed to migrate, boom, you're out of there September, October, so moving south. Um, for those owls that stay, I think they're owls, you know, they're they're built for the darkness, and so they probably just hang in there all winter long for those that do, and we're not sure what they eat. You know, a lot of people talk about them moving into town, perhaps eating lemmings that are running in, the, in between the buildings and the homes. Other people talk about them, uh, they see them out of the tundra a little further, hanging out where the ptarmigan can come and spend the winters in exposed areas of the tundra. So, um, and then others we know from satellite coverage, both our work, Canadian work, and some of the Norwegian stuff, that some of these adults will move out to open areas on the pack ice, where the pulling is, or cracks in the ice, and hunt waterfowl and or alcids, you know, like ox and things like that, murrelets and and all those little things, the seabirds. Okay. okay. Uh, when do they come back next season, and do the fledglings come back up here to this area or close by? Yeah, when do they adults? Well, we, we, some adults stay there, as we just said, and other adults will migrate back. And if lemmings are abundant, we don't know how they assess it yet, but if lemmings are abundant, then uh, they'll stay and breed. And whether these are the same adults or not, we just haven't banded that many adults. It's mostly been chicks, uh, who most of them are adults now. Um, but it's just so hard, you know, because we're doing so much that we don't have a trapping team. We actually need a trapping team up there. and We just need the facility to house a group of six to eight people in order to, to look if there's any site fidelity and mate fidelity. Um, I don't believe that there is mate fidelity, but there might be some site fidelity over time. It doesn't mean it's going to be there every year. But there might be some site fidelity over time. We have seen a few banded birds back in the area breeding. As far as the chicks go, uh, you're talking about natal dispersal. So do the chicks return to their natal site to breed, or do they go elsewhere? Uh, again, you know, the definitions are a little tougher on nomadic species when it comes to that, those topics there. So what we think is that um, it, it, we don't know, I guess, what, I guess is what I want to say. We just don't know about the chicks yet. And we're in the process of trying to put some satellite transmitters on the chicks and to see what we, what we can learn about, you know, dispersal, natal follow pantry. But the definitions are really difficult if you're a nomadic species. You know, you may be there one year and not come back for five years later. Or you may return the next year and not come back for five years later after that. So uh, definitions get a little muddy uh, when, we're trying, when we're talking about these nomadic species such as the snowy owl. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, next one. Research says that snowy owls fledge between 50 to 60 days. Can they do this earlier? Yeah, research says that. Um, you know, 
We did a growth rates and plumage development study on snowy owls. Had a pretty good sample size. I can't remember what it was, but it was, it was a big sample, over 100 birds. And um, what we found during our studies, uh, looking at their growth and their plumage development, was that they fledged between like 45 and 55 days. Now, defining fledging, you know, flying, some people define it as leaving the nest, others define it as flying, I define it as flying. Um, you know, just because you jump from me to the camera and you flap doesn't mean you're fledged. Um, so we kind of defined it as you get up in the air, you fly a short distance, and then you crash land and stuff like that. So for right around 45 to 55 days, I think one interesting question would be to see if males fledge before females. Because females are so much larger, does it take a little bit of a, you know, more time for them to develop the wing area? in order to gain lift when males are a little bit lighter they can gain lift a little sooner so i think that's something to be kind of fun to look at but anyway between 45 and 55 days is generally what we say okay uh when do male fledglings lose the dark markings when do they lose the dark markings i i, I assume you mean the dark markings on the white feathers um yeah, by the next by the next year, you know. So right now, you'll see both males and females. Females are going to be much more heavily marked with bars and spots. The males are going to have less bars and more spots. Um, but by the time that they, you know, the new feathers come in next year and they molt, they'll be a little bit lighter. Some people think three to four years. Um, we don't study molt as closely as some of the people I know who've done it in museums and a few in the field. But some people think that three to four years is when they start turning predominantly white. I've heard other people talk about even, you know, seven, eight, nine years or so. Uh, but I would say for the most part, uh, they probably start getting basically white in that three-year range, maybe four-year range. Still needs, you know, uh, more work on it, though. Okay. Will the fledglings leave or migrate together or separately? Do we know that? Yeah, will they migrate together or separately? It's real interesting. I mean, clearly you can see that the group comes back together when they can fly. I mean, you can see them right now. Someone sent a photo this morning of uh, five chicks standing on a mound right out there. Um, it's an interesting question. It's a question that we don't know. But what is interesting is that <clears throat> pretty, you know, not, I won't say larger numbers, but groups of these birds tend to show up in the same area at the same time of, you know, five birds, 10 birds, 15 birds, 20 birds. So are they all related individuals? Do they start out as a family group? Um, do they get up on the same weather front and just all go in this kind of a random thing? That's a good time to migrate because everybody pushes out. Uh, we don't know. We, but it is interesting because the groups are still together and Will they just up and leave together? And that's where the, you know, the satellite telemetry stuff could help us out quite a bit. I'm just a little cautious about putting them on young birds. Um, so we'll, we'll see where that goes. That's, so another question we just we just don't know the answer to yet, or okay. I don't. Okay. Uh, at this nest, do you know how many were male and female at the camp nest? You know, uh, Matt's up there now. He's going to try to figure it out. We believe that we could tell the difference between males and females are right around 35 days, and we can we can down it a little bit. So the very oldest one, the last time I visited that nest, and, you know, we didn't really check on those guys as much as we normally do because it was on the camera, and we just didn't want anyone to get offended. And so, but the oldest one that hatched, the one that had the dented egg and all that stuff, uh, definitely male. And so I have to look more closely at the photograph that was sent this morning. I probably could figure it out pretty Pretty easily on that way but you can tell 35 days or so right up to when they fledge you can definitely tell now we we took blood we made this prediction and we did this whole you know predicting sex based on plumage development snowy owls and we had 142 samples that we did this and we predicted their sex based on what we've learned from plumage development and then we took blood and we backed up the blood with it we sent it in and we didn't tell anybody what our thoughts were and stuff so we kind of did it double blind in a sense and we got all 142 correct okay um a series of questions came in from ginger uh how do the owlets establish new territories how do the owlets um i assume you talk about the chicks and how do they establish new territories uh hard to say you know what we've seen over the years 
is that young males uh, do not have territories. You know, they if they do, they're so far removed from everything. What, what we've seen over the years is that these young males, let's say in their second year of life or first calendar year, uh, second calendar year, um, they're spotted. They kind of look like females in a sense. What we've seen over the years, particularly in a big breeding year, is these males tend to hang out in bachelor groups by themselves away from the major breeding areas. And rarely are there females in there. We think that females probably can breed in their first year, although based on plumage and a few that we've captured, it doesn't look like many do, but they're probably capable. Males, on the other hand, we don't think that they're going to breed till. Well, they're not going to get white until, let's say, three to four years, so they won't acquire territory till then. And then when they acquire territory, just because they're white, does that mean that, okay, I can breed? Or maybe there's white-white competition going on between all these adult males and stuff. But these young males, they don't get to breed until they're, I would say, at least three, perhaps older. Okay. Um, the second part of that question was how far away do they go Um that probably refers to, do they come back to this area or do they, you know, strike out in, into entirely new areas? Yeah, which... and, you know, we're still trying to figure that out as far as uh, the young ones go. There was some work in Canada um, by J.F. Ferriand, and he found that some of these breeding females, small, the sample size was small, but nonetheless cool information, um, you know, often would move perhaps 1,000 miles the next year and breed again. So they can just get up and go. Barrow is different from anywhere else thus far that we know of in the world where there's snowy owls there. Uh, every year there's snowy owls in Barrow. And I don't believe there's any other place that we know of in the world where snowy owls are there every single year. And this just may have to do with the uh, lending densities in that area. So hard to say they can be all over the place, but they can also show uh, site fidelity too. So then you get in again to how do you describe these things. Just because a textbook definition says this, it doesn't mean that it fits you know, all these, uh, all groups of birds. Okay. Uh, do males and females move out differently? Do they move out differently? I'm not sure, but I think it's a migration question. I think so. That's, what, that's how Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, what, it, what appears to happen, we've seen this in long-eared owls in our long-term study of their short-eared owls as well, is, and maybe it's an open country species thing, a nomadic species thing, and what we see is that the... Um, the females kind of, you know, once once the chicks leave the nest, they're there, but, you know, they're, they're not as active, uh, clearly not as active in feeding their chicks. And then as time, you know, progresses and the chicks are starting to fly, the females, uh, they just up and leave first, and then the males continue to feed, and then they up and leave. But again, we need, we need larger samples, you know, and, and yeah, do, just need larger samples to kind of make this more of a fact versus what we think is going on. Okay. Uh, do siblings sometimes end up as mates, or how do they prevent that? Yeah, do siblings end up as mates? I, I, I don't know that that's ever occurred. I uh, I don't believe it. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, it may, may occur from time to time incest, but uh, in our study area, I can't say that we've ever you know unraveled that, but one of the ways to prevent that is to have different... Uh, dispersal strategies between the sexes and so what we find is that in in birds for the most part uh, females of a dispersing sex and males show site fidelity and that might be one of the ways in which they avoid inbreeding and just the opposite in mammals for example so in our long at all study we were able to have mark recapture uh, at a pretty high level and that's what we tend to see is that females leave and they are the dispersing sex, and the males tend to show sight fidelity. And over the years with them, and I suspect the same thing in short ears and snowies, um, they've never remated with the same one, and we've never seen any kind of incest. So it's probably just the strategy and how you disperse, which helps reduce that. Okay. And last question from Ginger. Do the parents retain their nests and territories? Do they retain their nests and territories? Um, hard to say. You know, I think that this male, this cam male, and we've, we've got the feathers, so we can look at the DNA. Um, but behaviorally and that area, and listening to his vocalizations, which I haven't recorded, he might be the same male. Uh, we tend to see the same territories occupied uh, every year, 
And so that's one of the ways that we go out and find nests is we know all the good territories. Then we go out there and we check those territories. Even though we check, you know, a hundred square mile area, um, there's always males on those territories. And whether they're breeding or not is another story, but there's always males. So we've yet to determine if they are the same males returning to the same areas. And just because you don't return the next year doesn't mean you may not return in years to come when the learning populations are adequate enough for another high breeding year. But in terms of using the exact same nest site? The exact same nest area, yes. The nest site, really rare to have even the same okay. mound used. Okay, yeah. But never the same, well, I won't say never, but, you know, the same nest. I, I, it may have happened before, but I can't recollect it. We've found out maybe like 260 or 70 nests. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. So that is the last question. So anything else you'd like to touch on before we sign off? Uh, yeah, I just want to thank you, you know, everyone for, and, and Explore in particular, but thank you guys for watching. Um, we put the first cam up, you know, several years ago, and the second cam didn't work out. And this cam, you know, I believe is our best one yet. And, you know, we're learning as we go. And, you know, there's a lot of cool information that we can glean from this if we sit down and, and run through the footage, you know, from a research perspective. But I think the more important thing is to bring this to the public and bring this to you to say, okay, here's the snowy owl, here's the Arctic, this is their life. Um, this is what we do for research and this is what they do for breeding. And, you know, in the end, um, will snowy owls be in barrel forever as things change? I, that I don't know, but the educational part of this is probably the most important thing. And we really appreciate, you know, Explore uh, sponsoring these cams and in particular several cams with us. And then we appreciate all of your patience and all of your viewing and all the information you provide. So uh, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll get another one up there next year. Maybe we'll get two. Yeah. Thank you very much, and I appreciate it. And we'll talk to you during the next camp session on a different species, I suppose. Okay. Thanks.